Hello everybody and thank you for joining us for this episode of Activist Lawyer. I'm here in the Granite Podcast Studio with Jack. Hello everybody and Ava. Andy, oh sorry, yes. Ava's here too, so just in case there's any baby noises in the background, it's not Jack. It's the baby. <laughs> or crying, it might, might be me. But uh, we're just giving a little introduction to an episode that we recorded last week. Oh, there she is. Oh, nice. oh you're full of crap today. <laughs> with the wonderful Emma Cassidy and Sarah Corrigan, who work with the Pills Project in Belfast. It was great. Jack, great ab- yeah, great episode for any uh, young people who want to get into that area. Like yeah. it's fantastic. Absolutely, I think it really speaks to what we're about at Activist Lawyer, what we've been trying to achieve in terms mm-hmm. of, um, you know, demonstrating different routes to getting involved in activism within the legal framework, and they really go through different options for people. So I think this episode, and I think this is what you took away from it too, will be really appealing to people who want to get into law public litigation, Mm -hmm. human rights law, um, equality, discrimination, things like that, but are not necessarily sure whether they want to actually qualify as a solicitor or barrister. There are other routes discussed here as well as qualifying. I think it's great because Sarah is a qualified solicitor um, and Emma didn't go down that route but has a master's in human rights law. Yeah, so I think they're a good combination. One shows the routes that you can go down if you don't practice Mm -hmm. and Sarah then shows the the routes that you can go down if you practice. So I think it was perfect yeah. for anybody who's battling with that idea of yeah. whether to practice or not. And some people have actually contacted us, just students who'd listened to the podcast mm-hmm. and they're really involved and they're saying, look, how could we do this? And you'll see the volunteering is a big part of this conversation as well. So the Pills Project, what is it? Well, I remember working in FLAC, the Free Legal Advice Centre, and um, run by PILA in Dublin. So it's quite similar. And the, the girls will go into detail about that. But just for some of our listeners, um, Pills, uh, really, well, their slogan is to advance human rights and equality through public interest litigation. So that's obviously in the title. Uh, And I suppose research identified costs as one of the major barriers. So they'll go through the finance um, Mm -hmm. being a barrier to people engaging in public interest litigation and lack of funding making it impossible for people to get a case to court. So another barrier that they identify is a lack of knowledge about how the law can help solve a problem. So they will go through a number of cases yep. that will show how things can be turned around quite quickly yep. in terms of getting legal opinions. And they have a whole panel of experts that they can tap into for legal opinions and to get some help if they're members, obviously. And then they'll go through some of the cases that really took they took on full mm-hmm. litigation yeah. to help resolve problems, housing, social welfare, um, anything involving access to justice. So it was so Really good. And then they talk about cli- uh, legal clinical education, mm-hmm. which for any young student, um, it'd be great to listen to. And it's hopefully an option that will be presented to students in the future. Yeah. Um, so it was a re- really, really good podcast. And I think for institutions to listen to Definitely. as well, because I think you being a qual- recently graduated yeah. and then doing your master's as well, the talk about being hands-on and getting involved yep, definitely. rather than sitting reading so the text. So hopefully somebody from <coughs> Queens or Jordanstown's... Oh, you okay? Me. Doesn't want to listen to me. Yeah, Queens or Jordanstown listens to this podcast and how important getting a practical experience yeah. is rather than just reading the books. Well, before this baby kicks off, <laughs> we'll sign off yeah. now. And really, I hope you all enjoy today's episode. And again, if you have any comments or queries, let us know at activistlawyer.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's recording of Activist Lawyer. I'm here with Jack. Hello, everybody. Yeah. So we're back in our studio and we're delighted to have in person in our studio two fantastic guests. We have Sarah Corrigan and we have Emma Cassidy. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank so you. It's lovely to be here. We are here primarily to talk about yourselves and also the organisation that you work with, which is PILS. And we are a little bit familiar with the organisation ourselves. We've had a few chats with you, Emma, and, and yourself, Sarah. We're familiar with some of the work that you've done, but you're here to give us some kind of highlights and important information that we think our listeners will like to learn about um, the organisation. But just as 
a quick introduction. So Sarah, yourself, you're a dual qualified solicitor. And before joining PILS in 2019, you worked at Housing Rights for nearly 10 years. So as the in-house solicitor, you acted for a number of tenants experiencing difficulties in maintaining or accessing tenancies. You challenged public bodies and worked hard in the fight to prevent homelessness and promote social justice. Okay. So fantastic, perfect for our podcast. <laughs> and yourself, Emma, you've joined Pills, the Pills Project in November 2018. That's right. Okay, so you took on the role of project officer and pro bono coordinator. All the things. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. So you're responsible for leading the project's communications work to raise awareness of public interest litigation and its impact, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Right. And Emma, you also manage the pro bono register, matching the members' needs. Of course, your organisation is based on membership as well. Exactly, yep. So with legal expertise and dealing with pro bono requests. In addition to this, you work with event organisation, the management initiatives designed to break down barriers that prevent people from accessing justice. So fantastic to have both of you here. So um, we'll get into the nitty gritty of some some examples of your work and how you support um, this quest um, to to help people access justice and also, also to support the legal profession and people involved in this area. But just tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe Emma, first about your background, how you got into this role. I know our listeners are always keen to hear people's journey so well I feel like I'm going to drop a bombshell on the activist lawyer podcast right at the very beginning because I'm not a practicing lawyer just get Uh that Uh yeah (laughs) we've had plenty of non-practicing lawyers we'll just get that revelation as important out there at the start um I suppose uh, my background is in the communications and media side of things for NGOs. I mean, I'm from Donegal originally, but I come to Belfast in a bit of a circuitous route. Um, <laughs> took a long-winded <laughs> journey um, via Dublin and Budapest and mm. Brussels. Um, but all of the organisations that I've worked for really, I suppose, have a common thread running through them. They've all been focused on access to justice, strategic litigation, using the law in a creative way, or focusing specifically on public interest litigation. I know we're throwing out a lot of terminology <laughs> already, but really, um, that's that's really the thing that I've been very interested in. And even though I've been working in the communications offices of all of those organisations, and that's you've, you've read out my lovely bio there, Sarah, <laughs> um, communications is a big part of, of the work that I'm trying to do with PILS as well to, to publicise the impact of what we're doing and the community of, of legal professionals that we, that we work with yeah. alongside our members. But I suppose that's always what I've been focused on is yeah. an organisation that wants to use the law in a creative way alongside communications people so there needs to be I suppose it's that old cliche of it takes a village to raise a child but yeah. it takes a village to create a public interest case too and you need communications people you need campaigners you need lawyers at every stage of the process really yeah. so that's always where my heart has been um, I mean that's where myself and Sarah actually just to age us a little bit um, we met in 2010 first of all when Emma, we were you're much older than <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can tell my voice is very youthful on this um but we met in 20 actually doing a master's in human rights law in Queens yeah um so I have studied law it's always mm-hmm. been something that I've been very interested in I've always I suppose had a question in my head of can I can I make an impact without being a practitioner and that's why I've been very lucky in the organizations that I have worked for that I've yeah. been able to work alongside really inspiring solicitors like the person who's sitting next to me um but th- yeah, so that's Aww. a little bit, that's a little potted history of, of, of where I've been. So it's a bit of LGBTI activism, a bit of public interest. I worked yeah. with FLAC in Dublin, so there was an awful lot of um, welfare reform, loads of different mm-hmm. themes. So a lot of things can come up, I know, in the course of co- the conversation today. But but my big thing is really about the collaborative part that comes into public interest litigation and getting lots mm-hmm. of different people mm-hmm. involved in the process. And so think, important. S- sorry, I think that's a big thing, though, with people who study law, whether mm. they can make a difference without yeah. practicing and I know we'll talk about it later in the yeah. podcast mm-hmm. but that's one of the things that even I was thinking about mm-hmm. whether do I have to go down the practicing route in order to make a difference but I think a lot of people a in that in this area mm-hmm. do you think yeah. that and we get the questions we actually got a few questions here about mm-hmm. that issue but we'll get to those I suppose um in a few minutes and Sarah just maybe your journey you are qualified yes. solicitor dual qualified yes <laughs> so my my story probably starts off <laughs> Like most people, um, it's a very familiar story. I, back in school, I was um, interested in Amnesty International and politics. Mm -hmm. Um, And my A-levels kind of dictated that 
uh, options open to me really were law. I think yeah. maybe half my year did law. Um, <laughs> so I would love to say from a very young age, I knew I wanted to do this job, but it's something that kind of developed as time went on. So my A-levels um, suited doing a law degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but really when I was... Um, when I, I was looking at what type of law degree I wanted to do, I did a bit of research and I came across this degree in Newcastle upon Tyne and in Northumbria University. And it was a degree that encompassed your LPC. And you also worked in a student law office in your final two years of your degree. And what that really was about and what the whole ethos of that that course was, this idea of, of clinical legal education really. So to to kind of you do your you do your law degree, you do your, your theory, but alongside that you also worked in a student law clinic. So every every um student was in a little firm and you helped members of the public. So I was placed in a housing firm. And we helped students, for example, with deposits, uh, with repair issues. We also helped homeowners with issues um, of repossession. So it's really, you know, it's really when I started to work in the student law office in my early 20s. And I could start to see that things that I was engaged with personally, um, issues around social justice and human rights, I could start to see that that actually could be a part of law yeah. um, and I know that might seem like a very obvious statement but when you go to study law at university everybody will know that you do your contract you're criminal and in some way I some ways I found it very hard to kind of it seemed slightly lofty for me when you're reading mm-hmm. these precedents and you're reading these judgments whereas I think what helped me for my career was working in this student law office so I loved it so yeah. a big thing I would always say is if you're unsure whether or not you want to practice um, or whether or not you think it would suit your personality or your interest. If you're doing a law degree, I always think it's good to maybe go out there and volunteer Absolutely. and get, um, you know, get get some, get a bit of experience. And I mean, I think you have to be persistent with your volunteering. I think that, um, you know, we're a very small team and we, um, we we're keen to to have volunteers and, and we're actually looking at trying to have some type of of project in mm-hmm. order to enable that but i think volunteering is a is a big thing then what happened i i graduated from that um from that degree i loved it but the crash happened mm-hmm. so um any kind of ideas of 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 what i maybe wanted to do after that the crash maybe kind of affected everybody who graduated at that mm-hmm. time. But anyway, I came home from Newcastle and I came home to Belfast and it was actually a friend's mother who worked as a social worker, told me about an organisation called Housing Rights Service at the time, now Housing Rights. And she said, this sounds like something very similar to you've been doing in Newcastle upon time. And I came, I went to that organisation as a volunteer and I ended up staying there for 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, yeah and I they were, they were so good to me and they're such a fantastic organisation. You were definitely taking your own advice about being persistent with your volunteering. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 10 I, years I, of know, persistance. I just phoned. I just picked yeah. up the phone mm-hmm. and I phoned and I phoned and I phoned. And um, I took a paralegal job that I really didn't like. And I, at night and on my lunch break, I just kept on phoning. And I kept on walking around city centres. And then it was a friend's mum who actually knew about my quest and, and told me about housing rights. And it's just had such a fantastic 10 years there um but anyway long story short I did uh I then I got into housing rights and I was put on their advice line so I remember on my first day um I thought I knew I had experience and they handed me these call sheets Mm -hmm. and these were people with real problems and um I think I had about 30 in my first day to work through so daunting and (laughs) it was an absolute baptism of fire yeah and 
I just absolutely loved it. Yeah, because you're making just immediately your, immediate your, your, change, your impact, and yeah, you know. Absolutely. And these were really some of them are really vulnerable people, or most very vulnerable people. I, I just I just absolutely loved it, and it's not for everybody. You know, people no. might do that and think actually my skills are more suited to the policy side. Yeah, absolutely. Of, or or com mm-hmm. side, but I just really loved that. Um, I think it maybe suited my personality. Um. About it's so being a bit of an arguer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but it's seeing that real difference that you yeah, make. Yeah, yeah. so I, I love that, and, and they're really good. I worked as a caseworker there, and then I thought, I want to get... I, I want to get more more skilled up on this. So mm-hmm. I did a, a human rights master's because I wanted to ground myself in mm-hmm. some of this theory. And I met Emma. Hi. And, um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a great yeah. course as well. And then I sat the institute exam. The institute was something that you need to do obviously if you want to want to qualify here mm-hmm. uh, I did my pra- I did my apprenticeship in housing rights and then I worked with them as a solicitor and the type of law that I did you read it in the introduction was about preventing homelessness so helping people maybe with mental health problems who were losing their home and yeah. um, people maybe um, you know with with difficulties in relation to like social yeah. security benefits and universal mm-hmm. credit welfare reform I knew pills through housing rights and then um, I moved to pills as a development officer and now um, I'm acting up as a solicitor and project manager for a while and yeah so that's kind of my it's a bit of a so what I would I suppose my not in as a succinct way as Emma to say but I started off kind of having an idea of mm-hmm. of what I wanted to do didn't really know how it could fit but I took my time and yeah. I think that's something I would say just get as much experience as you can mm-hmm. people sometimes feel they need to go to the institute at 21 22 mm-hmm. I didn't go to the institute till I was 25 yeah so I took that time to kind of there's a lot of money. It's important. Yeah. It is. There's a lot of money. And sometimes you don't know. It's, I think what you said there, they're persistent kind of t- t- around volunteering mm. to have that. And it just, I remember myself being very similar and I took a job. I was registering shares in some company in Dublin. But yeah. the real, um, I used to work then with the Irish Refugee Council and just bounce into work mm. every day. And I absolutely love it. But like you, thrown into the deep end. There was no time, you know, to, to kind of get to know. But the cases just came and that was it. And you dealt with them. Mm-hmm. So, but like that, I, I think it's very important to have um, to volunteer and we've said that before with guests on the show yeah. or even students who've contacted us after mm-hmm. listening for advice you know they would that would be the main thing that we'd say so yeah. we can have a wee look at that um, again and I think that is so interesting just to hear your journey and again of course working for Pills it's similar to um, Pila and Flack I yes. think in Dublin Yeah. so but reaching out so many areas that you covered do you want to go into maybe a wee bit of detail about the actual types of um areas that you are covering at the moment and maybe you know that you're exploring to kind of support there's kind of a bit of everything that's yeah. the nice <laughs> thing about <laughs> pills as work i think is that you know public interest litigation is in our name so if something is in the public interest we're looking at those cases mm. that have wider impact which then lends itself to the big heavy topics of the day so anything you can think of really I mean there's a huge amount and I mean with the news in this that's broken this week in particular we know there's going to be more around welfare reform yeah in particular um climate climate definitely um there's an awful lot of of things that are coming in the pipeline potentially um around there that's part of the the difficulty with pills as well is that when we're building cases like that Mm -hmm. A lot of the work's going on in the background, so there might be some breaking news that we can come back to you within a few months' time. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that's that's. Yeah, I suppose what maybe people might want to to know is maybe a bit like, are we public facing? Mm-hmm. So can anybody listen to this podcast, pick up the phone, and chat to us? And so the answer is no. So that may, mm-hmm. that sounds very like a barrier at the start, but it's not. No. But I, I maybe want to explain as to maybe just a bit about what we do and how people can contact us. I think maybe, although people can see that on our website, maybe they can just explain for, for a, no, a couple of do. minutes. Yeah, absolutely. So basically the... Um, Public Interest Litigation um, Support Project, um, PILS for short, because it's much easier to say. But um, what we are, we're a membership organisation. Yeah. And so members of our organisations are either, of our organisation, sorry, are either solicitors 
or NGOs, non-governmental organisations. So we have just over 120, maybe at last count, Emma, you might correct me, there might be more than that. 130. Firms themselves, or, so that's not individuals, that's the actual that's firms, firms. organisation. Okay. Yes. So if you go on our website, you can, you can see mm-hmm. who those are. And it's almost a 50-50 split, half are solicitors and half are NGOs. So for example, I mentioned housing rights. Mm-hmm. Housing rights are a member. Okay. So you need to be one of those 130 in order to gain access to the, sure. the type of support that we can provide. Um, and membership is free. There's no, there's no real obligation there, just that you can't be party political, mm-hmm. um, non-partisan, things like that. Um, so whenever you're one of the members, you can really get three things from us, okay? So the three things, and the first thing is what we're best known for, is we're best known for legal support and financial support. So for example, somebody maybe walks into an NGO or a small solicitor firm or a bigger solicitor firm has potentially a case that is affecting them, Mm -hmm. but also this is an issue that could affect everybody. Mm -hmm. And if a change was made with this case, it could have big repercussions. Mm -hmm. So we call that kind of case a public interest case. Mm -hmm. So it goes beyond one individual, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, a... uh, uh, like a, a car accident, an RTA, or a personal injury case, which are really important cases, but they're they're centric. Okay, it's more um, the cases, for example, um, maybe a um, a case. Spoiler alert: something we're going to talk about, but maybe a practice that is being done by a public body or an individual that is having ramifications for. 10, 20, 30, 10,000 people. So that kind of case, our antenna, it goes up Mm -hmm. because we think that kind of case is something that um, is going to need support behind it, okay? So say, for example, they would come to us and say, um, we had somebody walk into our office, we have this issue, um, we think it's a goer, but we're going to need financial support or we're going to need legal support, or we're going to need both. So, for example, to get a case like that off the ground, you need money. Often legal aid is not appropriate for that, or you cannot ask the individual to bear those costs. Mm -hmm. So we come in as a final option, an option of, of private funding. So we can provide that indemnity or those court fees to remove the barrier of finance. Mm-hmm. And then often, if there isn't a solicitor involved in one of the members, they will say, can you maybe get us a solicitor or a barrister to help? So we can kind of package support for them to allow them to start to take their public interest case. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, that's a very simple way of explaining it. And we'll do it very step by step process. Yeah. But that's what we're, we're most well known yeah. for. Okay? It's that practical that and practical financial s- yeah, support. It's just um, before pills... Before PILS even was started, um, you know, a research paper was done about the need for a project like ours. Yeah. And the two main things that were identified was that barriers to these types of cases and this type of change is money and legal expertise. Yeah. So income PILS to provide that. Sure. So that's in a nutshell kind of what we do. So you just lift the barrier to people trying to access justice. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly what we do. So what we aim to do. And then there's two other things that we're known for. Um, one, is, the next one is, is something that Emma manages and it is pro bono support and, and legal opinions. So sometimes people phone us and go, I have an issue that we think mm-hmm. might be public interest, mm-hmm. but we don't know. So Emma will then um, go about finding them legal counsel to do an opinion and tell them the merits of their challenge or potential options. And they don't necessarily have to be a member. So you they, can, no, they do, they do have to. Okay. They always have to be a member. But sometimes people phone us and in the back the front way we say, look, become a member okay, and then you can get this. Mm-hmm. And then the final thing is we do events, we do mm-hmm. um, training, we offer training for people. So they're really the three main things that we do. And if you are a member, you can get access to all those for free. Fantastic. That is fantastic. Just to buy this, so the financial support, that's clear, okay? Mm-hmm. Just in terms of um, touching on the whole area of taking a human rights case or a case concerning the public interest um, matter, it just seems like, you know, the biggest thing in the world to have to do. It's daunting, it's long-winded. You know, how long do these things take? I mean, is that the first thing that put people off, do you think? You know, it's, it's just quite a daunting process. What 
you know, levels are your cases at in terms of getting a turnaround or an outcome for people, do you think? Yeah, well, I think that's something, Emma, that we both, I think, even as a practicing lawyer, um, when I was in housing rights, a lot of our, our the casework that we did was very quick turnaround. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I went to somewhere like Pills, that was public interest, I kind of had almost a preconceived notion that it, it's quite lofty, that we're talking about cases that are years in the making. And sometimes that is true, because sometimes it's necessary. But other times, it's something that is extremely, a really quick turnaround. Um, I think that one of the cases that, that you're going to mention, Emma, is, I mean, it was a matter of weeks that we, from request to outcome. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the thing. I think, um, obviously, as you've mentioned, Sarah, I think it can be something that, that d- does put people off. It can be daunting. You think, where do I even start? And I think that is something that, that is um, sort of... Uh, we see a lot in public interest cases. It can be a very lonely place to start off from because even though the issue could affect lots yeah. of people, it does usually take one person to stick their head up above the parapet and say, sure. this is actually really impacting my life. And, you know, you have to be sort of a focal point for a case. So I suppose that can put an awful lot of people off. But sometimes using the law, and I think that's really one of the things that, that pills want to encourage lawyers and non-lawyers to 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 think about more and to use the law can be a fantastic tool Mm -hmm. for you to be able to get a really good outcome for people but it doesn't necessarily have to mean protracted litigation yeah um or litigation at all or litigation at all because as as sarah mentioned some of the things that come into us particularly the pro bono register that we've already mentioned some of those can be really quick wins Mm -hmm. so there's one example that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, the detail, so the investigative um, media platform based in Belfast, approached Pills in 2017, 2018. I must actually check the date before the end of the <laughs> podcast, just in case I have to uh, correct myself. Um, when they were undertaking a significant piece of work around mother and baby institutions, mm-hmm. they had uncovered some very powerful disturbing information about children who died as a result of malnutrition in these institutions. They were doing a really long form piece of work on this but before they went to print they obviously had a lot of legal questions around publication, about what they could publish, could they publish names, all sorts of questions that I suppose Mm -hmm. did get them um, quite anxious. So they approached us to say we have these questions, we don't know, this this series of of pieces that we, we want to run very much in the public interest what are our legal responsibilities here? So that was something that we could then go to an expert on our pro bono register that wanted to to volunteer their skills for free. We're able to turn around a really comprehensive legal opinion addressing all of the journalist questions in I think about 10 days. And then the the piece went to print and it was was one of actually the... um, the, the media pieces of media coverage that was used then in the subsequent campaign calling for an investigation um, and an independent inquiry into the conduct of, of mother and baby institutions in Northern Ireland. So there's there there are I mean there's there's cases that that the pills have been involved in that have taken you know a year or two to mm-hmm. to come to fruition and sometimes as Sarah has experience in housing rights there's a lot of pre work that goes sure. into it but sometimes there can be really really quick wins for a people quick turnaround wow well, that's fantastic i mean to have that as a resource for you know for that organization or any any other organizations that need i suppose just a legal expert opinion well, but are afraid to you know or don't know how to to where to, the issue. where to start? Yeah. I mean, it was something that we we actually experienced with one of our members, IEF, the Integrated Education Fund. I know yes. integrated education is something that has mm-hmm. been uh, has been talked about before on the podcast. There was um, a school in County Down, so Strangford Integrated College. So shout out to everybody that's just gone back to school in Strangford. Um, had put in a development proposal. They were consistently oversubscribed. Lots of people in the area wanted to send their children to the school. They just didn't have the space. Mm-hmm. Um, they had set, submitted development proposals showing the need and it was turned down by the education minister at the time, Peter Weir. Um, they were querying this, again, didn't know where to start, didn't know, had, didn't even know where to begin to dip their toe in, into the world of law and litigation. Again, through our pro bono register, we were able to, obviously it was, um, it was at the start of this year in April, so it was during times of COVID, but we were able to get online consultations going mm-hmm. with a the barrister. There was a legal opinion provided, but there was also le- a really practical, just legal letters to say, you know, we believe that the decision was flawed. Mm-hmm. 
sent in the letter. Again, it didn't even have to be escalated to something serious mm-hmm. that you're marching down to a courtroom in the yeah. morning, you know, with, with stacks of papers. And within um, a few weeks, the, reci- the decision had been reversed. Oh. And the numbers of people that are able to go to that school, I was actually just speaking to IEF yesterday, and the, the, the plans that are in place for expansion in Strangford are just fantastic. It's, and it's so positive to hear yeah. that. Um, so, yeah, it, it can be something that can be quite quick and have massive impact yeah. for generations to come. You know, Sure. And just some of the work then as well, I suppose you've been involved in judicial reviews and kind mm-hmm. of like bulkier, larger pieces. Um, is there anything that would be you know good to highlight at the moment or any recent decisions that you've been involved in that maybe did take that extra work that you were speaking about? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, it's something probably just to mention, I think maybe this might be quite an obvious thing, but I don't think anybody really wants to litigate. So um, essentially, as, as somebody who is, if you're involved in activism or a lawyer, you're almost trying to do yourself out of a job. You know, Mm -hmm. you want things to go well and to people Mm -hmm. to do the things they're meant to do and for people to to get on and Mm -hmm. people to follow law. And as somebody who's involved in activism, you know, you try and avoid litigation at all costs. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. But a lot of the work that we do, we have litigation in our name. But as Emma mentioned, those two examples that are really impactful, they didn't involve litigation. Yeah. And a lot of it is about just educating yourself. And I think something that pills try and do is we try and be that kind of center point where we gather all these experts together and they're so generous with their time. And, you know, some of them have have commercial backgrounds, commercial practices, Mm -hmm. but they have said, we want to help and we want to give it for free. So we try and be that focal point and we're all about getting the word out there about ourselves. So our members can come to us and we can give that for free and hopefully maybe stop litigation or get mm-hmm. ahead of it. And yeah, so although we had the name litigation and I know I'm going to talk about an example now that did involve litigation, it's it doesn't always have to. No. And we often hope it doesn't. But at times it is it is necessary. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, seriously impactful then. Yeah. Maybe some of your examples really show that, don't they? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There was a case actually that... Um, there's a case that Pills supported. Um, it's actually very timely now for it being September and um, traditionally students looking mm. for um, private rented properties um, or young professionals looking for private rented properties or indeed, you know, families. Um, there was a case um, that related to letting fees. And what I mean by letting fees are fees that you pay in the course of trying to secure a property for yourself. So, for example, they can be if you go to a um, an estate agent and you have seen a property, they might charge you for um, a photocopying fee mm-hmm. for your a copy of your tenancy agreement mm-hmm. or key money or a credit check. Yeah. So all these kind of administrative costs mm-hmm. before you even get in the door. And they're called letting fees. So these presented a these present a significant barrier to young people, people on low income, and um, often it means that they can't secure a a private rented property. And sometimes it, it, it leads to homelessness and it, it is a real it's a serious problem. Um Pills got involved, um it was actually a case housing rights I feel like I'm on a secret mission for housing right <laughs> <laughs> It's very relevant now. I know, I, mean, I know. The news this morning was all about the percent, the massive increase in applications for housing from mm-hmm. first year students. Mm-hmm. And things. Oh, yeah, le- yeah. so it, it really is. And I mean, you know, couple everything has a knock on effect on each other, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. When you, you know, um, the, the increase in educational fees, um, maybe parents who would have financially supported students maybe have lost their jobs during COVID. Mm. So all these kind of things become even more highlighted and more, and more important. And this is one of our particular cases that we see time and time and time again um, as always dealing with continuing impact of this case yep. but essentially it, it started it, it has its roots back in housing rights really in as early as 2013 possibly even a little bit earlier where they became aware that um people were not being able to access their um private rental properties because of these fees mm-hmm. so they were saying god before i even have to put up first month's rent and a deposit which sometimes was well over a thousand pound they were like i need another maybe 
£100 to even get copies of tenancy agreements. We got calls, people asking, is this right? Like, And the answer was that we had a piece of legislation, that a very old piece of legislation, that our understanding was that it was illegal to pay to ask for these fees. So that was our understanding. But that that hadn't been tested. That bit of law had not been tested. So um, in order to understand how big and how widespread the problem was, Housing Rights carried out a secret shopping exercise all over Northern Ireland and they could see that while some agents didn't charge any, some agents charged up to £100. And so we knew the problem was more widespread. Um, then uh, we collected data and then we got involved with with Queen's University who could see that their student union and they could see that this was a problem mm. so um, housing rights we were approached um, by a client who um, had paid these letting fees on a number of occasions and wanted to to challenge it under this piece um, mm-hmm. th- under this piece of law so that was a very small case so the I think the amount that, that the client wanted back was in and around £100 so um, but it was the principal we yeah. were yeah. the principal, so that kind of case goes to the small claims court because it's it's such a small, small amount. amount of money. Mm-hmm. Whenever the judge the judge actually was like, "This is a public interest point, right? I, this needs to go higher." Yeah. Um. So as soon as you know uh, cases start going into court, as soon as you get step in the courtroom, this the money starts starts ticking and mm-hmm. yeah. and your risk your risk sure. starts starts going through the roof so that's when housing rights contacted pills knowing that this is not suitable for legal aid we can't ask the client to bear this especially when it has going to have impacts so many yeah. so they contacted pills and pills were able to to put up support and they already had solicitors like ourselves and barristers to deal with it. So the support that Pills offered there was you know, indemnity and court fees so they could protect us and allow us to take the case. So that case was highly contentious. And, um, you know, they had a number of estate agent organisations saying they either didn't charge them and also disagreeing with our interpretation of the law. So what actually happened in that case was that there was a a judgment that said that letting fees in the way that they're charged, that usually letting fees, for example, they should never really be the tenants. There's There might be obscure circumstances or some circumstances mm-hmm. where a fee to be paid before getting the tenancy that that might fall on the tenant but more often than not it's a fee that should be absorbed yes, and by the, the, the general landlord. Yeah. Okay, because really it's the agent is carrying out a service for the landlord exactly. so this was a really useful judgement now we wanted um, we wanted that judgement to go further and to declare that all mm-hmm. fees all these type of fees were illegal but the judge did not go that far because he understood that there might there may be depending on the relationship yeah. there might be a circumstance that letting fees aren't, aren't yeah. illegal but more often than not they are so very helpfully what happened after that judgment is um the Department for Communities, they issued um, guidance on that judgment to landlords. Mm -hmm. So that was something that um, we continue to get calls on housing rights and it's continued to come into the press time and time again. And um, so we always encourage students, you know, if that's happening and if that's a barrier, particularly now if students are, you know, maybe they don't have the financial support they would have had previously um, to if they have an issue like that, to contact somebody like Housing Rights or, or look for that precedent. And those types of letting fees and circumstances mm-hmm. like it was in Housing Rights where it should have been the agent that they continued to pay that. So that case was successful. Pills didn't need to pay an indemnity. Fantastic. But their support allowed us with confidence yeah. to pursue it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, and it's I having a lasting effect. I mean, that's yeah. it's an outcome. Exactly. And sorry, Sarah, I just yeah. talked over no, your so No, no, no. It's just when, when you just start to get into this, it's... Um, I love to hear the practical, you know, aspect of it and how, you know, that outcome is so far reaching. But that's it. And that's really, I think, in essence, that kind of captures 
why pills was founded yeah. you know why that research was done we were set up as a pilot project yeah. the whole idea is that we are supposed to be a safety net yeah. there are going to be other potential sources of funding for some mm-hmm. cases sometimes there's there's members of ours that have more expert knowledge and sure. maybe it's more suitable for them to take it on but for those cases that but for the existence of something like the pills project would fall they and, would. And, and and wouldn't and wouldn't make it in and and I think that's the thing that I that's the thing that really drew me in to the Pills Project. Yeah. I, like Sarah, I'd known it for a long time and I mm-hmm. admired it from afar, but I didn't think there was an in for somebody with my background into it. But I just love the fact that that there's 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 constantly a story, there's constantly an update. The impact can flow from cases like this for, yeah. for years and years to come. And in a way, the thing I love about public interest litigation is in a way it def- redefines what winning is. Sure. You know, it's not a zero-sum game. There there can be cases where maybe the outcome doesn't go the way that you think, but ultimately it's a domino effect and it, yeah. and it sets a chain of events in, in place that that ultimately do change yeah. people's lives for the better. There was uh, there was a case actually that, that Pills supported through our litigation fund and the, the pro bono register both that got an awful lot of media coverage this year. Um, it was motivated by a Fermanagh woman actually called Lorraine Cox who had been diagnosed at the age of 37 with motor neuron disease. Um, she had approached the, one of our members, great, great, really active strategic member of the law centre, um, and she had been experiencing problems because she was trying to access social security benefits, but under something that has become the so-called six-month rule, um, if you cannot provide medical evidence that you're going to die within six months, you cannot get um access to fast track benefits under the special rules procedures. So even though she had been diagnosed um, and couldn't get, you know, medical evidence mm-hmm. to say she's going to die within six months, she still had to go through all of the, the processes to try and get access to, to mm-hmm. social security mm-hmm. benefits. Um, there was a case taken. Um, it was appealed. Ultimately, the appeal did not go the way that, um, that we'd all hoped. Mm-hmm. But before the appeal had gone through, the Department of Communities had acknowledged that this six-month rule was a huge barrier for yeah. people that it was unjust in, in other parts of the UK the regulations had been changed and the Department of Communities have made a commitment to changing, to changing that it. so that can show that even though the ultimate yeah. result because mm-hmm. obviously we know these things can always be appealed mm-hmm. what Lorraine has done and what the Law Centre have done through their legal team support they have changed the law yeah. and that is and it, it's not not in force yet but you know if anybody's listening from the department of communities <laughs> we, we're, we're watching with interest to see um to see that put in place because that is going to change people's wow. lives yeah. and that's what i really love is that sometimes you can have a win that looks very different to just it allows yeah. the problem to be highlighted exactly they're, they're exactly it shines a light yeah. on things that people yeah. are having to live through and that um that they shouldn't have to yeah. so the public interest law piece is, is so clear i mean and that mm. affects all aspects of life all of us as we you know live in our, our daily lives and we don't even know what's going on behind the scenes when it exactly. comes to that type of work but just to move on a little bit i mean there are fantastic examples mm-hmm. yeah. about um, the organisation affecting change in, in so many different ways there, whether it's a quick kind of turnaround or something that's, you know, a valid um, challenge that goes on for some time. But just Sarah had mentioned as well about the clinical mm-hmm. education piece that you um, personally, um, you know, underwent as well, I think, um, in terms of having your experience with um, in housing, in social housing law. We had um, Larry Donnelly from... NUIG Galway which is where I went to university and I'm thinking back to my many 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 long time ago <laughs> years ago of studying law and it was your big junky books mm-hmm. with your um, case law and you were looking everything up and you had your Lexus Nexus and all of that but flashbacks. really I know uh, flashbacks mm-hmm. is right but really it seems to be turning away from that um, when it comes to education and I, I love to talk about this and to mm. explore it a little bit more. I, I'm not, I, we only heard about it through, I think Galway had published a piece that this is what they were trying to do with their students mm-hmm. and reach out to the local community in terms of getting that experience. Can you maybe, I know that's something you're interested in too as an organisation. Can you mm-hmm. explain firstly maybe what that means, this clinical education and how maybe we can achieve this? Yeah, absolutely. So a big part of Pill's work is actually, is legal education. So it's about 
speaking to to students when they're younger, so we deal currently with undergrad with the mm-hmm. two main universities, um, Ulster and Queens, and we also are on the syllabus at the Institute of Professional Legal Studies. So we deal with undergrads, and we also deal with those who have made a decision or ready to practice. Right. So. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but I think it's it's, it's a lot lower than other jurisdictions. That's the amount of people who actually do a law degree mm-hmm. and maybe go on not to practice. Yeah. So, and sometimes that's you know that's a personal decision. But sometimes, um, well, it's always a personal decision. But sometimes we want to ensure and we want to, for people to understand that there is a way to use the law that's not necessarily a corporate writ or a high street route, or, um, you know, in-house, which are all fantastic, really interesting roles. But sometimes people might not know that an area that they're interested in, that there actually is a pathway for them. Mm -hmm. So a lot about the work that we do is showing them how the law can... I'm trying to think about the best way to, to make it sound attractive, but how you can use the law to affect change. Yeah. So how the law, you can maybe, the law isn't doesn't have to be this lofty thing. It doesn't have to be something that you maybe see on suits, which is really cool. <laughs> or Ali McBeal, if you're yeah. my age. My I know, I love Ali McBeal. I'm the fourth time watching suits. So oh, it's, <laughs> it's so good. So, um, Spin-off podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I know, suits. It's getting me through my dissertation. That's oh. what I watch while I'm doing my dissertation. Oh, I love if it. If only. Suits. It's, it's yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, suits does have a law clinic in it, so to be fair, it's, That's right. it's not there madly yeah. removed. But... Um, so yes, so it's really about you know exp- trying to take it down, strip it down to its basics, mm. trying to get the students to to see and to understand that what they're learning about, um, you can apply that to everyday life, yeah. and that's really if they're simple problems that you can use the law to affect change, mm-hmm. or for example, sometimes people might come and we might speak to them, and we'll advise them about a whole world of law I had no idea about, for example, policy. Yeah. I was like, if somebody had told me when I was 18 about policy, I would have thought, what is that? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I actually seconded to policy for a while when I, um, previ- in, in my previous role because you s- and comms. So, for example, to, to get a successful legal case, especially a public interest one, you need a comms team. Yeah. You need a policy team. You need campaigners and you need researchers. And if you're interested in law and making change, my advice would be to try and get exposure in all those areas. And some you might find, this is the natural fit for me. So, for example, in policy, it's you have to be a good writer, a good speaker. You have to understand legislation. If you're going to do maybe law, you maybe have to be... Um, your skills might be more, for example, into to arguing and problem solving. Now, that doesn't say that... You mute, they have to be mutually exclusive. You can be good at everything, but I would say try and get experience in all those areas, yeah, and um, see what is the best fit for you. Absolutely. And don't do not look at other people and think I need to be, you know, deciding what I want to do at twenty two and paying a massive fee to go in professional fees to end up sitting in a job at twenty five and thinking, oh yeah, God, you're so right. I yeah. wish I took more time. Life know, isn't life isn't linear. Careers aren't aren't always linear. There's not a set route that you know that you, and you must never know, do you, and you exactly. never know who you're going to meet. You don't and what opportunities are going to open up there. And I think law itself is a great um starting point, you mm-hmm. know, um itself for any type of career. But I suppose how how do we affect that change and how do we get institutes to maybe move away from the more traditional route because I'm sure there let's look at Ireland and the UK I'm mm-hmm. sure you know the same lectures are there that have been there for 20 years mm-hmm. teaching whether it's constitutional or family law whatever it might be you know how do you get that message out there I mean it used to fall on the student themselves because yeah. I remember with me <laughs> you know it's like I had to go knock doors and say hi mm-hmm. could I do a week's volunteering here or whatever mm-hmm. but there wasn't a program in place there wasn't any support around that it was basically show up sign your name in listen do your exams and that was yeah. it now there were some very proactive I'm not going to say there weren't especially within human rights in Galway a fantastic mm-hmm. human rights law faculty there mm-hmm. but um, you really had to put that effort in yourself and it depended on on the person yeah. but I think as you're saying it should really start from an early age I think um, so University of Ulster has a they have a legal clinic 
and it's it's similar to Northumbria where mm-hmm. they would their students would deal with with members of the public coming in um, who have an issue. It really has to be uh, an organisational, it has to mm-hmm. be like a, an organisational decision or an institutional decision to move that way. Yeah. There is a bit of resistance because there is a lot of people who like the traditional approach, but I think it could start with even having a, a, a pilot or a mm-hmm. programme within a traditional setting yeah, that allowed the students this opportunity, and I must say, you know, some institutions are getting better at mm-hmm. doing that. Yeah, where maybe even if they teach a traditional law module, but they will always try and infuse mm-hmm. the, you know, an infru- infuse a much more practical approach. I was just going to yeah. say it is about a, a practical application, of but the it laws. makes sense, doesn't you, it? How are you supposed to? <laughs> do you know what I mean? I like, know, it, I know. It, it feels a bit like when um, you would study. Well, this is mm. my experience now. Um, studying languages at school, and then you'd you know be thrown in to do a practical yeah. oral exam mm. when you haven't spoken it Absolutely. to each other. I mean, it's about it's the using same thing. it. It's about yeah. using it as a tool all the time. And as Sarah said, cultural change can be very slow. You know, universities Especially within the yeah. third level sector. Universities, <laughs> I mean, are, are, are just as prone to that as anything else. Yeah, but I yeah. really think if, as an organisation that started as a pilot project, you can test things you out. Can. And I really think I, for universities, I think it's something that, that particularly now, not just after COVID, but, but as a result of that as well, yeah. people are looking for something different. People are, are looking for a way to be able to align what they're doing professionally with their, their core values personally mm-hmm. as well and I think it would be a real a really strategic sensible thing to do for universities to be able to offer that because I think Definitely. that's going to tempt people in like, people would want that mm. people would go yeah. to something like that if there's a clinic if there's some way that you can see how what I'm slaving over in the yeah. library what I'm actually doing that for yeah. how that's actually going to help somebody practically not just to get a 2-1 or not a 2 not just yeah. for me tick not the box yeah. exactly. and graduate elevate yeah. it beyond as Absolutely. you say a box ticking exercise like when we were speaking before the podcast mm-hmm. a couple of days ago mm. when you sir you mentioned clinical education that's the first time I ever heard of it yeah. before and I would have benefited and I, I'm sure people in my yeah. class would have benefited yeah. from that practical experience yeah. because the, the only practical experience that you got with applying the law was maybe in a problem question that you had for yeah. an assignment. Mm. And that's and sometimes as far as universities go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. and it's still restricted because sometimes you were looking at things and you were saying maybe I could go down this route, but then you had to think, that's an alternative view. Yeah. You have yeah. to go down yeah. what's going to be marked. What, what, do, I, what, what do I want to be yeah. marked on? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So yeah. I think I and um, everybody yeah. in my class would have benefited from that practical experience, absolutely. like applying the law. It sounds really basic, right? But I even liked... This maybe you don't know how much this is saying about me, but <laughs> I remember in one of my first days being told to write a letter, right, and taking a day to write a letter. Yeah. So yeah. like learning those basic skills of like managing a file, mm-hmm. or like, and that makes you really employable. So mm-hmm. I remember going for my first job to volunteer. It was like, well, what do you, what can you do? Yeah. yeah. Can can you write it? Can you write a letter? Can you open a file? And I could say yes because I benefited from clinical legal education. Yeah. So. Even things like, you know, spending a day agonizing over a letter or agonize o- over agonizing over a phone message to a client mm-hmm. to convey, you know, a couple of, of simple instructions because I wasn't used to talking about the law in a practical way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is those that's why if you don't get it in university and I really think they should try and introduce programs like this throughout. And yeah. it's not you know, it's not maybe suited for everybody, but um if you can get experience at even letter writing or talking or giving advice at a local CAB, mm-hmm. a local constituency office, um, I think that that makes you really yeah. attractive. And it could even be introduced as a optional module. Like Absolutely. you see, with undergrad, you can choose specific exactly. modules so people can decide if it's something they want to be interested in. Something they want to do. Like so, yeah. I think that'd be a great. Yeah. Well, I think it's necessary going forward, and I think the first time I saw, I mean, mention of it recently was with I think that we were saying about Larry Donnelly publishing yes. a piece on Galway, and I was so thrilled to see it. Mm-hmm. On I think it was just on LinkedIn. But I was like, God, that's amazing. And that's something yeah. that I would have really loved to have been mm. a part of and certainly would have opted. I know Jack 
content that would be right up your street oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. um, because you're so curious as well and to see how things work but you're right I mean you don't really look back at your textbooks and think oh yeah I remember that <laughs> chapter on whatever you're not you're, my favorite yeah. paragraph yeah. you Love have to that. act quickly in many circles you know when you're just there kind of responding um, you know to whatever comes your way but those yeah. skills are essential and I think as yeah. you say um, Sarah to get them anywhere really yeah. sets you up for life but do it sooner rather than than later I think yeah I think so because I think is, I yeah. think when you're studying law at an academic level you're constantly looking at the past mm-hmm. like law is yeah. always about the past you even in a, a case you're looking at previous cases mm-hmm. uh, to rely on or previous legislation and I think you can get dogged down in mm-hmm. in, in the books and looking at previous cases but a lot of people want to make change for the future mm-hmm. And you can't really do that if you're just reading textbooks. Yeah, well, that's it. And as, and, and as you've mentioned, Sarah, w- there's there's fantastic people out there that have been beating the drum about clinical e- yeah. legal education for a long time, like Larry, just to say I did work with Larry when I was in, in, in Flack, Flack and he was yes. a Fila. Um, so small world. But yeah. I think the more people are aware of it, the more people that get out there and Absolutely. talk about this as, yeah. as, as a possibility. And I, I, just something you mentioned earlier, Sarah, as well, a lot of people when it's put on the student it's mm. it's very hard because some people are in a position to be able to say I can come and I can volunteer for free mm. some people don't aren't in the position to be able no. to avail of those opportunities so if if it's made accessible to people Jack as you say whether it's yeah. through an optional module that people can opt in or whether it's something that's built into courses yeah I mean that's I just think the more people that have access to this the better absolutely absolutely you access. should never actually be out of money when you volunteer as well so if you are volunteering somewhere um, you know, you should get travel expenses paid for, you should get lunch allowances. And I know it sounds small, but if you're out money, that's that's obviously not something yeah. that's it's no, good. No, and it's very it's a very unfair system where somebody would absolutely. really climb the ladder very quickly because they could afford to do, you know, an unpaid internship exactly. for a year somewhere, but the other person who's equally as skilled, you know, and as motivated and passionate by that issue mm-hmm. cannot because they have to take a full time job somewhere in pay for it. And that I've seen that so many times, it's yeah. so unfair. So that you just raised that as well about making that accessible to everybody mm-hmm. and anybody who takes up um, law especially within third level well particularly yeah. with some it's of the issues that come crazy. up I just think yeah. some people are actually the people who have lived experience of particular Absolutely. issues or have, have mm-hmm. interacted with the law in a particular way and those aren't, aren't always the people that get to go in and, and shape mm-hmm. agendas in particular organisations so I think um, yeah. more diversity is key here 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 <laughs> well look <laughs> it's very clear I mean we'll, we'll move on to our last section that we kind of we speak to everybody <laughs> about but it's very clear from both of you that you are very passionate activists about a range of areas but just the actual the process itself in terms of accessing justice and enabling people to um to do the same and I mean we've spoken about uh, we've really just scratched the surface I guess about the work that you guys actually do there but the examples you've um, raised with us are just yeah, have been fantastic he's so involved like these aren't just talking about it these are actually Damned, yeah. You know. mm-hmm. So I think we'll ask our last question anyway. Go um, for it. Just around, it, obviously, this podcast, as you know, is activist lawyer. And mm-hmm. um, we've had non lawyers on as well, just um, given um, equally uh, important views and um, kind of opinions. But just yourselves, it's such a basic question. How important is activism? How do people get involved? Our listeners that are listening to the two of you and kind of figuring out, you know, the routes that you took. What advice do you have to our listeners that maybe are interested in this area? So, do you want to go first, Emma? Oh, I don't mind. Sorry, I didn't want to talk over you. (laughs) No, no, not at all. I mean, so I think kind of what I said at the beginning, I mean, if you're an organisation who wants to get involved or maybe if you're qualified and you want to get involved with us, you can become a member Mm -hmm. or you can join our pro bono register. So you can become... um, and organize you can become a member for free or you can contact us and get on the register mm-hmm. and we'll have a conversation with you um which you can say look what you'd be willing your time you'd be willing to to give um what areas that you're interested in you want to provide an opinion or you'd be interested in having a consultation and if you're qualified and if you're an organization that's the way you can do that's what you can do if you're an individual so if you're somebody who is maybe more in the infancy of your career you're a law student or you're somebody who's maybe trying to decide what I want to do you can volunteer with us now we we weren't in the office there for a period of time so volunteering wasn't overly mm-hmm. practical mm-hmm. 
But we are going to be returning to the office, fingers, fingers crossed, very, very soon. And we're really keen. I think because both Emma and I have have availed of opportunities like that in the past, we're really passionate about giving people their, their chance. And mm-hmm. even if it's, you know, if we can help people link up with maybe members of ours. Um, so if they can contact us, and we are always willing to have a conversation. Um, I think, I'm trying to think about, you know, about what I would have benefited from having listened to this podcast um maybe if I maybe about 10 years ago, I'm being too nice to myself 15 years ago <laughs> over the time Jesus, I always say very old here like I'm ago. young I'm young <laughs> <laughs> I'm young. <laughs> yes I think I would have wanted to say this is all well and good but how and I think you know I would be keen if if in Northern Ireland there was some type of mentorship program introduced you know something where um, everybody can avail because in Northern Ireland it can be a bit who do you know yeah. you know and um, I think I would be keen to see something introduced where there's a bit of a mentorship program mm-hmm. um, where, where younger people can avail of of opportunities and get advice and guidance but certainly give us a call um go to our website address we're both on linkedin people we'll share that as well yeah Yeah. absolutely always willing to have conversations even on a personal basis Mm -hmm. so please feel free to contact us yeah excellent very practically if people are listening into this and thinking "Mm, i like the sound of this Never done any pro bono, not really sure what that's mm-hmm. about. If you want to dip your toe in and mm-hmm. hear a little bit about how you could get involved in some pro bono work, the first week of November, the 1st mm-hmm. to the 5th of November, is actually the 20th birthday of UK Pro Bono Week. So across how timely. I know, <laughs> happy birthday, Pro Bono Week. Um, there's Pro Bono Weeks actually that go on right across Europe as well. So the whole month of sort of end of October into November, there's going to be lots of stuff online for people to, to, to get involved in. But UK Pro Bono Week specifically, um, PILS are actually on the organising committee wow. for, for for Pro Bono Week. So we will be holding online events, possibly. I mean, we would love to do something in person. We'll see, fingers yeah. crossed, COVID regulations Hopefully. permitting. But take a look at that. Take a look at what's going on in UK Pro Bono Week. There'll be events where you can start to learn at whatever stage of, of pro bono volunteering you might be at. Have a, have a listen in to some of those events. Follow us on Twitter. Um, follow UK Pro Bono Week. And I would say activism sometimes can be a bit of a, it seems like a big title. Yeah. You know, it feels like, oh, am I, am I doing enough, you know, to call myself an activist? Mm. If you are pushing for change, if you are doing something that pushes the envelope a bit, and is rattling a few cages and is trying to push for change in whatever your professional capacity is, then I think you can call yourself an activist. I think that the thing about it is, um, you know, just just stand up and stand true to, to what your principles are, particularly when people aren't watching. I think if we're if we're all um, teaming up and, and being better allies, it's sometimes we can go to protests and and it's sometimes easy to pick up a placard. But I think if we're um, as long as we're staying true to our values when people aren't watching as well. I think that's the, the key allyship thing. But yeah, exactly. Stay exactly. positive. I think that was, there was sometimes when you, you can doom scroll a lot and there yeah. seems to be, you know, we've been talking this morning about different news stories that are coming out mm-hmm. and it can it can be very easy to feel that the world is a very heavy, scary place. And there is mm-hmm. rollback on human rights. Like, we're, let's be realistic. We know we're not, we're not naive. We know that there are awful things going on. But there is a massive community of people yeah. that are that are working um, so to change true. that. Um, you know, it, whether in climate activism with all the, the young people now that are taking climate cases. You know, in their teens. Mm-hmm. You know, they're. I'm just in awe of everybody that's doing that. So really, just you know, stay positive, yeah. stay hopeful. We had Brian Stevenson actually a couple of weeks ago right. joining us remotely, and that was one of the big key takeaways I took from that. Because if we are trying to create change. We all have to stay hopeful. So I think that would be my my top self-care tip to any activist listening in. Well, look, I'm sure any of our listeners listening to both of you today will be in absolute awe at the amazing work and your fantastic attitude and can-do approach to everything it's just been so practical and just yeah, so yeah, informative and positive this, i already so. feel very positive after yeah. that listening to the two of you so well done thank you so much for coming on today thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for having it and i think having us and i don't think we we're not just i think saying that to say it i think no. we're both really keen to 
for people to reach out to us and if we can help because we know how important it is sometimes yeah. just to to know where to go to so yeah please do, please do. Uh, listeners and if if we can be of any assistance or you know guide people that that way as well we'll definitely be sharing this far and wide and again thank you so much for giving up your time and we'll be in contact again soon to check in with you to see how you're getting on fantastic <laughs> we'd love that thank you so much thank you sarah thank you jack thank, thank you again. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving you listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.